everyone. It's Ashanti Golar with the Brown Girls Guide to Politics. We are here today with Amy Allison of Democracy and Color and the founder of the She the People Summit. I'm so excited to have you guys get to know her. I am a huge fan. I've admired her for so long, and I just love her dedication and commitment to women of color. So, Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. I mean, how lucky am I? to be on the Brown Girls Guide podcast. And you, I have been admiring you for a long time. So I'm, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm blushing. All right. So first off, Democracy and Color, when it came out the gates, it just got so much attention because during that time, we really didn't have an organization that was upfront and vocal about, look, we need to be paying attention to the new American majority. So can you tell us about your work with Democracy and Color and the importance of the new American majority in politics, particularly after the 2016 election? I'm telling you, 2016 was, um, it was the, the, the moment of reckoning uh, for the country. But my work in multiracial progressive politics started some 30 years ago when I was an undergraduate with uh, Steve Phillips. And Steve Phillips and I, um, he's the founder of Democracy in Color, and I'm the president. He wrote a book called Brown is a New White that put on paper the data that demonstrates that the progressive multiracial electorate is the majority. That's how we got President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And that we now um, have a tremendous ability to define the politics in this country for generations, but only if... Uh, we change our view and our focus and, frankly, our resources to um, deeply invest in the fastest growing and strongest progressives. Those are people of color. So if you look at uh, the new American majority, it includes uh, people of, of every race. And we're not talking about 100 percent of the people, but the majority of African-Americans and Latinx and uh, Asian-Americans and uh, native voters are progressive, vote progressive. And understanding that, then contrasting it to 2016, where uh, 75 percent of the over one billion dollar war chest for Democrats was spent trying to woo moderate and conservative white voters. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Democratic Party has been oriented you know, to that for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it really, really cost the country so much. And as all of these indictments come through and all the damage and ripping kids from their mothers at the borders, everything that's happening in this country right now comes down to the fact that when the Democrats were crafting their strategy and deciding where to put their money, they decided the most important voters were white voters. And that's mm -hmm. where the money. And yet, if we look at the new American majority, it's women of color, particularly black women. We showed up and we have for decades. So really what Democracy in Color is pointing to is that we already have the power, but it requires us to um, uh, force the country. That's all the people who are the donors and the party, you know, gatekeepers and the opinion makers to look at the electorate and whose vote it will actually determine the results of elections much more differently. And that's addressing not only gender, but race in a very significant way. So the new American majority is a, a significant new playbook um, that we believe has so many possibilities for the midterms this year and for the presidential in 2020. Yes. Uh, as usual, just so well said. And if you have not read C. Phillips book, Brown is the New White, check it out. You know, I had my copy. It was great. I got another copy in my net roots bag. So I'm like, now I got two. Like most people would give theirs away, but I'm like, no, I'm keeping mine so I can have my backup. But so many people know that I am a huge fan of Stacey Abrams. I totally fangirl over her and you are too, but your love for her went to the next level when you created Get Information for Stacey Abrams. Can you tell us a little bit about what led to that initiative? And we all know that Stacey has already blazed a trail. You know, she's just one step away from being the first black woman governor in this country. 
And we always said that it was going to be really black women stepping up to support her in key ways. And you did that with this initiative. So tell us a little bit about that, but then also how the people listening can get involved with it. Well, remember a year ago, right? Summer of 2017. And the so-called experts in the Democratic Party um, and in the state Democratic Party in Georgia didn't believe a black woman was electable. I mean, there's a mm-hmm. reason there hasn't been a black woman governor in the history of our, you know, over 240 year history of our country. And um, so she faced not only uh, the barrier of being electable, considered electable, but also the barrier for uh, Democrats who said, look, uh, she's not going to appeal to our most important voters, which I just said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they believe is, you know, white moderates and white conservatives, even people who voted for Trump. And Georgia's a place that's been controlled by the GOP that Trump won by 213,000 votes or so. So a year ago, the challenge of, of, of which there are many facing Stacey Abrams' candidacy was that she needed to be elevated to a national level for the country's most fervent and strongest progressives. And those are black women all across the country. Black women are the highest vote turnout uh, group of any race and gender. And black women have been for decades, but been unacknowledged, uh, largely unacknowledged as the backbone of the Democratic Party. And I knew if I called, get in formation, right? So this little Beyonce call. Yes. <laughs> we all know what that means. I live in the Bay Area. You're on the East Coast in D.C., but if you live in Ohio or Chicago or Texas, you know what that means. Mm -hmm. And because black women have the ability to activate our communities, our networks, our families, and that we also have the power of the purse that we're not acknowledged. Like when when I talked Mm -hmm. about President Barack Obama, black women were such an important force behind the volunteer and fundraising efforts for his successful candidacy both in the primary and in the general, but we weren't specifically acknowledged. Mm-hmm. And this get in formation was an acknowledgement of our power nationally to focus in our energy on helping Stacey Abrams have lift. And when I called get in formation, black women across the country answered. Um, and uh, well, you could just imagine back when she announced uh, her, her uh, candidacy for governor in Southern Georgia, uh, we were all, you know, I went down there in Albany, Georgia, where I was the only person from out of state, actually one of the few people from outside of southern Georgia. So that's a rural black Georgia. Mm-hmm. It was in a, uh, it was in a, uh, I remember in a park, there was gnats everywhere because, you know, <laughs> it's Georgia. And I felt the weight of history and the importance of her standing in Georgia, which is the birthplace of the civil rights movement and declaring her candidacy. And I saw the way black women from across the country uh, were the um, fire stars in terms of her buzz. Now, we fast forward, um, get in formation now means something totally different. Get in formation, I called for black women to get behind her, right? And women and men of all races said, you know, we're, we're down for that and we're gonna yeah. support her. And so um, one of the things that, uh, Part of the, the magic of and the importance of her candidacy goes well beyond the fact that she's a black woman. I mean, we want to make history, and that's very important. But if you talk to millennial black women, they're like, ah, we don't care because we've been disappointed by people who are uh, women or, or people who don't tell us just identity is going to be enough. And truly, her campaign is the strategy of her campaign over the last year has uh, been um, revolutionary. She invested her money and focus on in expanding the electorate and talking to voters that are normally ignored by both parties. She, there is a network of these amazing call hidden figures, these women of color strategists like uh, Dewana uh, Thompson or Latasha Brown, the women from the South who are running voter engagement campaigns. Because 42% of the registered Democrats in Georgia are black women. Again, such an important. <laughs> So imagine you have this historic candidate who's, you know, super qualified and already a tested leader. You have a strategy that brings more people into the 
be a democratic process. And you have a whole set of organizers that really expand on the power of black women's organizing and the black women as a voting base. Voila. A year later, it's not just that she's an, you know, an interesting candidate. She's actually the Democrat, Democratic Party's best hope of turning Georgia blue the first time in 10 years. And they've run white candidates statewide and have lost every time. And now the country's looking at her campaign and her strategy as a test case for the new American majority. And so I look at Stacey Abrams, I'm like, uh, I'm fan, I fangirl out all the time. <laughs> She's extremely approachable and um, important uh, leader, but she's not only just important in Georgia, she's important everywhere. So that's the exciting thing. And I, I think uh, we've got a big fight, though, because look at who she's running against now. Yes, yes. We're dealing now with them wanting to close voting locations in predominantly black areas in Georgia. Like they are pulling out all of the stops, you know, to decrease black turnout. And something I say all the time is with these voter suppression laws, gerrymandering, you know, they don't do it because they don't think we vote. It's because they know we vote and that we're powerful when we vote. Yes. And this is just them trying to suppress our vote and therefore our voice. But love Stacy, And I totally agree with you being with her being so humble and approachable. When I started the BGG, I emailed her team and I was like, I'm starting a blog. Would I be able to interview Stacy for it? You know, I was like, I know she's so busy. And within five minutes, they responded, yes, like, we'll give you some time. And I wasn't expecting a response so quick. I'm like, y'all are so busy. But she really wants to take the opportunity to not only support my blog, but to talk to brown girls about how important it was for them to get civically engaged. So, yes, we hope all of you will love Stacey the way we love her and get information because we know we can get her elected. But it also speaks to not only her commitment, but your commitment to showing that what is possible and that for black and brown women who want to serve and who want to lead, you often will look around and say, you know, I don't have the support from the people in the immediate, you know, what do I do? And the thing that Stacy's race is showing is that we can tap into a very powerful national network of those of us who are interested and elevate and support black and brown women's leadership. And it is, it is, we're just starting to tap that potential. Yes. I agree. And speaking of great black and brown women running for office, you ran for office. You ran for city council. And it's something we talk about all the time on the BGG. So tell us, like, what made you run and what was that experience like? I have to say, when I decided to run, I ran in a special election. Running for office wasn't anything that I thought deeply about. At the time Bush was president, the war uh, in the Middle East was raging on. It was a, a very difficult time. And I said, look, what can I do for my own city? And I ran in Oakland. I didn't have a lot of training. I never went through a merge. I was, I just had, look, I'll figure it out. I'm an organizer. I got a network. Let me do it. And I think uh, what was really amazing is I took on – um, an establishment, moderate white woman. In a city like Oakland, you'd say, well, um, you know, it, the, the same race dynamic shouldn't be at play as other places where we see gatekeepers blocking um, women of color. And yet that's not the case. It happens here in, in Oakland like it happens all over the country. Um, I was just one of those statistics of women that ran. I ran as hard as I could. I left my corporate job at that time. I was a corporate director in that, um, you know, uh, in a payroll company, if you can believe that. And I, um, I decided to dedicate everything to running. And I learned a lot and I got a lot of support, a lot of people out on the streets. I remember my campaign was featured as one of the most exciting local races in the Bay Area, just hundreds of volunteers and the visibility. But what we didn't, what I didn't have is really good advice and support to understand who the gatekeepers were to do what Stacey Abrams told me she did, which was long before she ran to write a, a multi-year plan about mm. 
what the what the trajectory could look like. I didn't have mentors or sponsors in place. Um, women um, who would you know believe in my leadership and would put me in the right places and set me up. And so I was learning about all this while I was running, which is very very difficult. I also um, suffered because I'm not independently wealthy, so I was trying to work. And when I left my job um, and and ended up losing um, out of 42,000 ballots cast, just a few hundred votes, it was a painful loss. And then I never ran again. And so there's so much in that experience that taught me what it is to have authentic powerful, courageous, women of color leading, how we need to be prepared, how we need to be vulnerable, and yet how we need to plan and build our teams and our uh, support network. Um, And I think so much of that, you couldn't have asked me, you know, after in in, in 20, in 2006, if you, if you said that I'd be advising candidates for governor or, um, (laughs) or congressional candidates or point, you know, like all, all of that, I would have said you're crazy because um, I had a campaign that failed. But what I realized is failure isn't the opposite of success. Failure is part of success. And that we women of color, girls of color have got to be okay with the risk. Cause you know, your average white guy, not even, you know, you know, He'll try something, he'll fall down, he picks himself up and keeps going. And that's the characteristic that I think over time I've helped to develop and encourage with, with other people. Yeah. Well, I just got emotional listening to you because it's what I hear so many times from women is they never saw themselves, you know, running, but it became, what can I do for my community? You know, how can I help my country? And that's what inspired them because we also know women run for office to get things done, you know, and when our black and brown women get in there, we also shake things up and make them really right. So thank you so much for running. And I do hope you run again and you know something that you talked about too is you know with it being Oakland people you know wouldn't expect to have those type of race dynamics and I had the pleasure of seeing you a few weeks ago at Netroots Nation where you gave this powerful fiery speech about the power of women of color and you were delivering it to a majority white audience. So tell people, particularly those who have not gotten on board with the fact that they need to invest in the leadership of brown women, you know, why is it important and what can they do to help? I mean, think about, thank you, by the way, for saying that. I really (laughs) appreciate you. Um, That speech was very important um, in terms, because we're, we're at the cusp of a political, a new political and cultural era that centers on women of color. And I think the 2016 election settled a lot of questions. Um, 85% of white women, uh, married white women voted for Trump. 53% of all white women voted for Trump. So when it comes to who's, who's the voice of progressive women and who should be leading, um, certainly all women need to follow women of color, particularly black women who have, uh, who are the vanguard. But when mm. you look at um, Netroots, it's 3,000 or so representatives from some of the most powerful progressive organizations, unions, um, uh, donors, some, you know what I'm saying? They're people who have a lot of resources and they move not only sentiment, um, they drive the focus of the work, they validate and elevate particular types of candidates, and they drive money into campaigns and strategy. Mm -hmm. My message was that uh, my new effort, She the People, about elevating the political voice of women of color was to tell that group, get in formation behind women of color. It's not just women of color are the most powerful progressives at the polls. It's not just that we are soon going to become the majority of women. And it's not just that we literally are the most fantastic organizers and political strategists and that we expand and save democracy in places where the democratic party has left complete populations. You know, they'll come either the last minute or not at all. Like in our state, California, 
7,000 Latinx voters become eligible to vote every day. Nobody's talking to these 18 year olds. And why is mm -hmm. that? It's not just because we have these amazing, courageous candidates who are elevating this uh, vision of um, social, racial, and economic justice and more poignantly and more beautifully and inspiringly than really almost any other set of candidates. It's all of those things. And if we want to win a progressive future for our nation, we need to elevate women of color to lead a multiracial, inclusive, progressive coalition called the New American Majority. So I told this group of mostly white activists and leaders that it's time to reorient. <laughs> It's time to evolve. It's time to get behind women of color and support us, invest in us. Don't just uh, say thank black women, which happened after the Alabama special election, um, Senate special election in 2017. It's literally making space to elevate us. And um, I know that um, this is a significant cultural change in our politics. And um, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, half of my family's white. My mom's white. And so in this country, white plus black, we round up. So I'm a black woman with a white mom and white family. And it gives me a very uh, comfortable sense of talking to white people about what their responsibility is and how they need to evolve. And so for my perspective, um, I, uh, for people who are like, oh, what, what about you want to talk about race? No, uh, that's not the times we're in. We have a white supremacist totalitarian uh, mm -hmm. in the White House. Mm -hmm. We have a Congress that has handed over uh, any sense of uh, decency and accountability uh, to our communities and to what their role is. We have a Supreme Court that's being taken over uh, by uh, these. Ter we this is not the time to ignore the most important driver in our politics, which is race. So we women are in a unique opportunity, a special role, to be able to tell the rest of the progressive movement what's what. Because uh, the old, I always said, I was like, in that speech, remember I was like, um, the old playbook, which led to the stunning losses in 2016, is dead. Mm -hmm. All the strategists, all the old ways of thinking, chasing after white swing voters, spending millions on TV ads instead of getting organizers on the ground, Forgetting that the Democratic Party is 46% people of color and that 25% of all Democrats are black. Forgetting that we have this powerful block of women of color that we should be talking to and elevating. That <laughs> playbook, it's already losing. Mm -hmm. And so there is a group of, I'm just going off, but there's a group of... <laughs> go off, go off. <laughs> they may have a lot of money based on that old playbook. It's mostly white guys move over, fully fund the strategists, nation's top strategists for women of color who are going to actually win based on the new American majority strategy in Florida, in Georgia, where Stacey Abrams is running in Arizona, where you have that magic combination. And that's why I, I made that very strong case. And I will continue to make the case with She the People Summit be, and um, for the next three years. Um, I say three years because Let's just let's change the whole national conversation about women of color in politics. And then let's win back the House and governor's mansions. And then let's win the presidency. I figure I'm, my job is done. We get a new president. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully a woman of color, but, you know, you're somebody good. <laughs> no, like, I love it because you are one of those people. It's like you talk the talk, you walk the walk, and you're so doing that with the Sheeta People Summit. I'm just honored to be on the steering committee for it. The Brown Girls Guide to Politics is one of the partners along with Emerge America. And I remember when you first told me that you were doing this, I literally started crying because there hasn't been anything like this before. It's just so groundbreaking. It's going to be transformational. I can't wait until September 20th, you know, just to see it. Every day people reach out to me about she the people and coming to the summit and, you know, women are planning extra events to get together with the women in their state and from their networks that are coming. So tell us a little bit more about what we can expect from she the people on September 20th in San Francisco, California. Well, people are just like, why is it San Francisco? Okay. <laughs> why is 
Francisco. I'm just going to tell people, look, two reasons. Well, three, three reasons. One is uh, multiracial organizing amongst women is really powerful here. And um, we have a lot um, to share with the nation in terms of uh, this coalition and this voting block that we're strengthening and calling out and building. Second is London Breed is our mayor in San Francisco. And London Breed is the only, I mean, there are very few uh, black women mayors in the whole country. And she's really, in terms of uh, large city, I mean, she's it. Mm -hmm. And it's significant because the black population is under 3% in San Francisco. So for people who say, uh, can a black woman, for example, be elected by a multiracial electorate? The answer is yes. Look at San Francisco. And then the third is our sitting senator, Kamala Harris, who herself is a woman of color and is a progressive voice in D.C., represents us in California, is on the short list of presidential contenders. And while she considers that and we see what the whole field is, the fact that she's even on that short list and being taken seriously is historic. So we're going to have in San Francisco, five, and we're maxed out of 500 people in the room. So we know it's going to sell out. And I just really want to encourage um, people to uh, register and come and be part of that. Uh, the room will be mostly women of color, oh, like more than 80% women of color, and a mix between all the different things when being a woman of color means. Um, we have registered right now women from 27 states, and so it's a national conference. And the state is going to be pretty awesome from um, Dolores Huerta, who she's the OG because she just turned 80. Um, and we're in the last bits of, uh, you know, confirming um, anti Maxi, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, also 80. So we have people who, who have been in the struggle and voices for a long time. But we also are bringing in Rashida Tlaib, who is the new, who newly won her um, Michigan primary for Congress. She's Palestinian American and she'll be the first Muslim in Congress. Um, and we're, we have um, uh, Pramila Jarapal, who's a congresswoman from Washington, who actually herself comes out of the immigrant rights movement and was organizing in the Northwest women of color to run her office. She would do these trainings. She's freaking awesome. So we, then we have um, movement leaders like Alicia Garza and Aijin Pu to share what our vision of what we want to do. Yeah, we want to be at the table and we want to drive policy, but to do what? What's our vision? And so it's a day-long um, exploration of this, and we'll have uh, time in the day to actually network and build our alliances to begin this network um, and to begin this movement that will last over midterms and the presidential campaign. So it's going to be, it's historic. You know, in our country, there's been a few gatherings of women that have, uh, universes have come out of them. Um, many people know the Seneca gathering. It was a lot of mostly white women mm -hmm. um, with a few notable, like Sojourner Truth, a few notable exceptions, but mostly white women that had been active in the um, movement to end slavery in the United States and in Britain. And they got together and talked about women's rights, and that created an entire movement. Um, there was, in the, in the early 70s, the first and only national women's convention that was uh, federally funded, um, Bella Abzug, who was one of the first women, white women in Congress, who got the funding for it, and they gathered in Texas uh, to talk about what the, you know, it's kind of like the beginning of what the ERA and the women's agenda might be. The term women of color was born there by black women who said, yeah, that's your agenda, but here is our justice agenda. And, and other women of color joined in on that, and they, they became a grouping there in the early 70s. She the People, this summit, I believe, is as historically important as any of those events in determining the future of uh, women and women's movement and our leadership and voice in this country. I believe universes will come out of that. Um, we're going to have young women as young as 14 in that room. And they are so, you say 14 is too young, it's not too young. Because in just a few years, they're going to be voting and they're going to be leaders. And I want us to get support them and for them to be ready to lead, along with the people who have been activists and leading for a long time. So it is a very, um, it's such a privilege to create this platform um, because we're telling a new story to the nation.
And we, for the first time, want to be fully seen and heard. And for us to do that requires us to look at each other, be in the same place, and to tell and to really, really um, change people's idea about what is possible in our country and what leadership looks like. So I'm talking on and on because I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. It's like every time we talk about it, I get more and more excited. So everyone, please visit shethepeople.org to find out more, to register, and we hope to see you on September 20th. Amy, thank you again so much for joining us today, for everything that you do, for being an inspiration, a role model, and letting women of color know that there is a place and a voice for them in this political system. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashanti. You're doing amazing, amazing work. I'm trying to be like Amy, y'all. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Until next time.